right. Welcome to Healing School. Man, I am excited to have you guys in the room. Number three class in our uh, six, kind of, and then we have the break, uh, I believe, April. So is our, our, our month off, but we'll come back after that. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to jump in at the very beginning for those watching this later uh, on our YouTube channel. I uh, want to welcome you. Uh, we've got some people in the room as well. So we're watching here uh, in the room, or it'll, you'll see the, the, the little screen at the bottom. I'm sorry for our technical uh, uh, challenges. Could we say that? We don't know how to make it big screen like the real production team does on Sundays, so you're going to have to kind of look at the little screen, but uh, I want to set it up so it's a quick video from Francis Chan, one of the pastors. Uh, we've just kind of watched and, and heard messages from through the years, uh, definitely connected to multiple things like passion movement uh, for college students and things like that, but uh, it's really fascinating what he ties into an element of his past doctrinal positions uh, with healing and experiences, and, uh, and it'll kind of set up the topic for today, so so let's kind of put our attention to, uh, to the little screen as you're watching it, or you guys can uh, watch the screen behind it. So let's play that, baby. I want to say something about the healing. Okay. I know, I'll get in trouble. Okay, but... <laughs> okay, so let me just say something. For when I first believed in high school... I took this book so literally. Got saved in a Baptist church. They told me to read the Bible. I start reading the Bible. And I'm like reading, going, whoa, are you kidding me? With faith, I can move mountains? No joke, no exaggeration. I went in my bedroom, I closed the door, and I thought, I'm going to move stuff. <laughs> I did. Because I'm just going, that's what the Word of God says. You know, and I'm just like staring at my chair and going, I believe, you know, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, I'll start with like a pen, you know, that's not moving. <laughs> and then I literally just thought, okay, if I can just make this shutter a little bit of the body, you know, nothing. And my like, gosh, you know, what was that? And then, you know, when people start explaining the word of God to me and they go, well, he didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean this. He didn't really mean this. And then throughout life, people just kept telling me, I'm like, gosh, it, it seems like that whatever I ask him is like, no, he didn't really mean that. He wants us to do things beyond what I can imagine. No, he doesn't. Re and everything just kind of got reduced to no, no, no. So every promise I would see, I began to just look at it and go, I probably didn't mean that. Hmm. But I would just later in deeper study, I just go, gosh, I'm seeing these people with faith. And it was that faith of the centurion goes, no, Jesus, I know what it means to be in charge. You could just, you don't even have to go to my house. And Jesus is like, whoa, I've never seen faith like that. There was that crowd pressing in to see Jesus right after that. And remember when that woman touches him? And he goes, who touched me? The disciples are like, everyone? <laughs> He's like, no, 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 no. No, not like this one person did. She went after me and power went out of me. And I'm just looking, I go, gosh, see, there's, there's people where it was that faith, it was that belief. And, 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 and I'm just going, Lord, I want to be one of those people. And, and just going, God, I believe in this. And so for the last few years, I have believed, believed in miracles. And I have, you know, when I meet the sick people, pray for them and, and believe for healing. And I'm, and I'm so shocked because every time I would pray, nothing would happen. It gets discouraging, you know? And, and sometimes I'd even go like overseas to where I'd hear about all these miracles happening. Go, okay, let me at least see it. And I'd get there, whether Africa, India, whatever, and nothing. They're like, oh, you should have been here yesterday. <laughs> so it, it was like this complex, you know? But I tell you, when I was in that village two weeks ago, no believers. They don't even have a comprehension of healing. I'm going, God, please. Please hear. 
People started coming forward for healing. Every person I touched was healed. You guys, okay. This is, this is craziness to me. I have never experienced this in 52 years. I'm talking like a little boy and a little girl who were deaf. We lay hands, she starts crying and smile. Again, these are not Christians. These are not people who even heard about Jesus. And she's freaking out. And we're like, lay hands on your little brother. You know, we lay hands on him. And he starts hearing for the first time. Like, you guys, this is out of my comfort zone. This is stuff I can read about, but I'm going, man, it happened. It happened. I mean, just stop, like, left and right. I'm going, this is, and that's why I'm going, God, I don't want to leave this. This is, I mean, I, I, I thought I had faith, but my faith was at another level. And I think there's some things that contributed. Some of it was just faith in his word. That then when Jesus says, I'm in you and mm. you are in me, to take that literally, seriously, to take it literally. I mean, think about that passage in John 14. Jesus talks about, you know, how he's going to go to the Father, you know, and then Philip says, can you just show us the Father? That'll be enough. And Jesus says the weirdest thing. He goes, how could you say that? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. That was the strangest statement. No one talks like that. My kids at school say, I'd like to meet your dad. How could you say that? <laughs> you, you, you don't, right? But Jesus was saying something so out of this world. He goes, you don't understand the oneness the Father and I have. Mm -hmm. It's like nothing on this earth. He and I are one. And if you've seen me, you've seen him. He's going, what in the world? And then you see Jesus pray in John 17. He goes, Father, just like you and I are one, I want them be to be one. in us. It's good. He says, I'm, I'm going to abide in you, and you abide in me. And somehow, when he says he is seated, he says we are seated with him mm. in the heavenly places, <laughs> far above all rule and authority. There's a real way in which I am abiding with Jesus right now. Wow. As he sits on his throne, far above all rule and authority. And there's a very real way that he is in me and abiding in me now. And so when I walked in that village with a little bit of fear, I said, no, no. This is no different than if you walked in the village. Come on. And I know what you do, Jesus. There it is. You proclaim the good news and you heal. And I could do what you, I started having this mindset again. Go, no, this is what the Word of God says. Mm. How good is that? All right? I mean, it's experiential for, for someone who had years of doctrinal perspective of this isn't fully accurate or this, you know, being explained away. That's not what that scripture really meant. And for a lot of Christians, that's their journey. And some of us in the room or some of watching, that's been our journey. We've been taught not to believe in church, like the church has taught us, don't believe scripture. And I love because God such, uh, such, such radically changed his perspective because of his experience. Now let's build on what we've been talking about the last few weeks because we don't judge the word off experience, but experience can be defined by the word. And, and so for him, he wrestled with what he's hearing, but he reads here and he's not experiencing. And then he finally experiences what was literally in there the whole time. And, and I love the, the perspective. And this ties to even what, you know, some of the things you heard God share um, to, to, to our, our community this morning even. Um, but him say, literally stopping where anxious thought or fearful thought was there. Wait, 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 wait. When I walk into the room, Jesus walks into the room. 
And I think that's such a, a powerful revelation if we can all get. And, and what Jesus was about, therefore, his church should be about. And, uh, and, and again, it ties to the whole theme. Why we set the premise for this class is out of that passage in Matthew that documents when evening come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He casts out the spirits with the word, you know, even, even that idea, that place of authority. Remember the, the disciples wrestled with, you know, delivering people from demonic oppression, and then Jesus shows up and it's like, what's the deal? You couldn't handle that? You know, like, hey guys, let me talk. You need to, you need to pray fast a little bit more. You're not just quite there in confidence. And, but it, it just said with the word. He, he wasn't kicking and screaming and, you know, trying to, no, he leave. Leave. You, you can't stay here anymore. But that last passage is really the, the, the setup for this whole healing school. And he healed all who were sick. All who were sick. And, and the last time we were together, we dove in. If you remember, I kind of said I pulled the lid off the, the, the gift, off the box, off the package. Um, but we dove into the idea and the understanding of the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. And, and this was what I left, kind of a cliffhanger a little bit at the end. But God never says no to the prayer of faith. Of faith. And so for some people, again, we, we kind of picked that apart. If, if you uh, weren't here, go back and, and, and listen, watch that on YouTube. But the idea of, of what we're going to, we're going to go, we're going to go a little deeper into the idea of faith and understanding what we mean when we say God says, never says no to the prayer of faith, because we're going to find out where we get faith, how we apply faith and how God responds to faith. Now, Again, and I'll hit it, hit it in a few minutes, but if you're asking God for like direction in your life and you're wanting to buy a car and it's a lemon, but some, you know, God, should I buy this? And the answer is no. Like that's a different, that's a different prayer than, than, than standing on God's promise in a prayer of petition and faith. And so I just want us to, to really have that uh, clarity as we go into it because like it or not, and I said this last time, to the day, we as followers and disciples of Jesus have to acknowledge that he put a high priority on levels of faith. Just, just as, as you heard the example that Francis Chan uh, gave, and even we heard this morning, uh, uh, you know, tying in the this this, this story and this journeys of faith and what we believe and all that, we're going to look at uh, a couple more. I want to build off of, I think we, we covered it a little bit last time, but let's go back to it. Mark chapter 10. And uh, the, the screens will have the slides as well. Uh, but Mark chapter 10, let's look at verse 46 through 52. And I think Missy did mention um, Bartimaeus this morning. He's a beggar who was, who was blind. And, and uh, you talk about the sound. I think I'm going to have to pull that into a few things we talk about tonight. Um, but the sound of Bartimaeus was, was catching the attention of Jesus as he walked through the city. And, and, and so if we dive right into it, and then we'll kind of pick a few things apart here. And I've got one other story, like I said, to go to that Missy mentioned this morning. But in verse 46, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great, a great cloud, crowd, Bart, in a great crowd, if I can say that right, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. There are people that don't like your sound, all right? You know what I'm saying? He said, have mercy. And Jesus stopped and called him. And they called the blind man saying, hey, take heart. Get up. He's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, kind of like a beggar's cloak, sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? As I said last time, remember, you would think that is a, a natural understanding. Well, I'm... I'm blind, I'm blind, you know? But Jesus is all the time putting it on, what are you expecting this moment to accomplish? What are you wanting from me? What do you want? What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, teacher, rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Right there, there's the key. And, and a title today is we, we kind of dove into the prayer of faith last time. We're going to say, we're going to talk about receiving by faith. And, and again, Jesus over and over dove into this through the Gospels. He would, he would ask questions. He would pinpoint what they want. And he would establish where they were in their faith. Faith. And so I want us to catch that. He said to this blind man, he's blind. 
Jesus says, your faith, your faith, your faith has made you well. So we're going to dive into what, what does that mean to have faith? What do we put our faith in? What, what did he have that was such great faith? I mean, you heard Francis Chan talk about the Roman centurion who understood authority in his position of power in the Roman government. He understood that there are minions or there are, there's, there's the soldiers, the officers that are under him. He doesn't have to be in their presence, simply gives a word, and they have to respond. He understood faith. He understood healing simply by a natural understanding of authority. Okay, So how did Bartimaeus say, your faith has made you well? What was his faith in? And so for us to, to really kind of understand, we got to understand what faith is. Now, Habakkuk 2, 4, when you go back to the Old Testament, this is the, the first time prophet Habakkuk is right here. Behold, his soul, soul is puffed up. It, it is not upright within him right here. But the righteous shall live by faith. As Missy pulls up, you can look at Romans 1, 17. Paul quotes it there. Uh, you see again, the righteous live by faith. Galatians 3.11, again, Paul is echoing this thought that Habakkuk said. And then you go to the writer of Hebrews 10.38, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Okay, so Paul's echoing what God spoke through the prophet and the, the writer of Hebrews, whether that's Paul or someone else, we don't know for sure, but they're echoing this, this one thought. So four times in the Bible, It says the just or the righteous, justified means righteous, the righteous live by faith. So we live by faith. Not that we have a faith. Well, my faith is Jesus. My faith is Buddha. My faith, no, we we live by faith. There is a level of lifestyle in the Christian life that is called faith. It is either doubt it is no faith. It is great faith. It, the, that this is a lifestyle he expects us to live. And Paul said in the second letter to Christians in Corinth in chapter 5, verse 21, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we may. This is kind of where I was going with Ben this morning of, of the idea of putting on the garment versus necessarily being the one trying to get to Jesus with the garment. You have become the righteousness of God in him. Now, Steve, so some religious traditions, but I have heard all my life, and I've even read in the Bible, in the Old Testament, says that, that our righteousness as his filthy rags, there, there's no one righteous, no, not one. And that is accurate. That is so true. But in context of the story, you and I in ourselves do not contain or, or even maintain or, or live up to any level of righteousness that will redeem us and set us free from the power of sin. In him, we are receivers, we are the joint heirs, we are the recipients, as we talked before, the last will and testament, we receive the gift of salvation, and then we become righteous. It's, it's, it's like if you were in a court of law, and here you are guilty, and yet someone comes in, the judge says, oh, I'm bailed, let him go. That their, their debt is paid, their penalty is paid. Someone came in, paid the penalty, or, or someone else is going to go to jail for you. Or It's the same idea. You walk out free, you are righteous. You are in right standing with the law, with the system that you live in. And so for us to understand that, here is even how we become justified. How do you become justified? Well, God makes us justified, Right? We are the righteous of God. He makes us just. So Paul says in Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by, what does it say? So even faith is what justifies us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, but it's our faith that causes us to become righteous. And I'm going I'm to build on a little bit more, and we're going to get to it, and you'll, you'll understand where I'm trying to get to. Romans 10.10, 10, again, Paul's saying it. For it is with your heart that one believes and is justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So someone on the street, some neighbor, someone says, hey, how do, how do you get saved? Right here, one scripture. You, you don't have to quote it verbatim, but if you understand the heart's got to believe, and you got to speak. 
That, that's, how, that's how you operate the things of God. Faith is not just a spiritual topic. It is a defining lifestyle. I believe, therefore I speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it could simply be the very first time someone hears the gospel message preached or you share your testimony and something inside comes alive and, and there's this want, there's this interest, there's this, well, I want that. All of a sudden, there's not a demon in hell that can prevent that person from becoming a born-again believer. Because all of a sudden, they have received a word. How does a Bartimaeus have faith? And what does that mean that he had faith? What was the faith in? It, I mean, it obviously, it wasn't his cloak. He threw that off. It wasn't in the people around him because, I mean, they were first telling him to shut up. And next, like, hey, come on. You know, like, what was his, his faith was in Jesus. Th- that's it. Rabbi, I want to recover my sight. What would cause him to go to Jesus to yell, to be ridiculed, to, to be mocked, to, to yell even louder? What would cause him? Inside, he believes if I just, it's, it's like we're going to read a second with the, the, the one with the issue of blood. If I can get his attention, he can heal me. That, that, that's, faith is, 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 is occurring within him and causing him, and this is for a later date down the road, we'll, we'll look at James when it talks about corresponding action, faith and works, and uh, you know, if you don't have works, you don't have faith, faith, I'll show you by my works, like all that interaction in James, um, the, the first chapter, but for us to look right here, here's a key principle, I want us to get this, everything in the kingdom is received by faith. You cannot get saved if you do not have faith. So the idea of someone like, well, they're a person of faith, the moment you hear the story of Jesus and the promise of redemption and that you could have a fresh start, that is a word that you either receive or you reject. The moment you receive it, faith is birth. Even Hebrews says that God's given to every man the, the measure of faith. Doesn't mean necessarily your level of, like, he gave you great faith and you weak faith. No, the measurement system, the way faith works, he is given to mankind and how he can measure. He has great faith. She has great faith. I See, he, he had a measurement God has put in place, and everything in the kingdom works by that. Justification by faith. That means Salvation can only be done by faith. Why? None of us are at the foot of the cross right now looking at Jesus, looking at his stripes. We're not at the tomb. None of By faith, I have heard and I now believe. And so to step into that, what do I do? I confess Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I ask him to come in. What? I'm having a conversation that's taking me into this step of salvation, being born again. So, I mean, anything, Holy Spirit, the idea, some of you in this room, watching online, you've, you've taken that next step, and you've asked the Holy Spirit to fill it. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe with the evidence of speaking in tongues, you've asked for that. And, and here's the, the, the cool part where I have heard so many different people process all the scripture, and well, that, that scripture right there just means that's not for everybody, versus that not everybody will. Not everybody will get saved. Why? Because not everybody believes they can or that he did it for them. So, see, everything in the kingdom is by faith. We hear it, we either receive it or we reject it. Therefore, finances. I believe God wants me broke. That, that's, that, that is setting your course for what your interactions with, with jobs and, and, and investments and, well, I just always, I always make bad decisions. Remember, we're talking about the sound this morning, the sound of right here. By faith, I understand this promise says if I do these certain things in obedience and out of a heart of generosity, here's what God says he does. Now, I can receive that or I can reject that. Healing, same thing. I can receive that by his stripes I was healed, or I can reject. No, that probably doesn't mean me. No, he didn't. He meant spiritual healing, not physical healing. And all these things are, are things that 
churches teach all over the country. I mean, all over the area here. And so it's not my job to go correct other churches. It's my job to find out the principles and how they apply to me and our house here. And so if we look at any kingdom principle, it can only be received by faith. Just thinking about that. And, and it's kind of interesting, too, as you start understanding what I believe matters, then my faith can actually grow. I, I'm putting myself in a posture, as we've said over and over. We say every Sunday, God, you have more. I want to know it. I want to grow. I mean, all this, that you're setting yourself in a posture that I can go to the next level. I can graduate from milk to eating meat or Strong tofu, you know what I'm saying? Like we can go to a higher level of, of, of taking things in and my body, my spirit, my mind can now process this truth. It's just like all of a sudden someone who comes from a tradition of hearing something, you know, it's like trying to tell a kindergarten how to do calculus. Don't think they can comprehend that. It, it, it's just, it's in stages God leads us in the growth and the pursuit of faith. So here's the thing. And a lot of these things in your notes, you might, some things might not be. Faith is not denying that the problem exists, okay? Did you hear Pastor Missy this morning say, we're, it's okay to get the emotion out, to be honest with what's going on inside, but we don't stay there. You heard us say it before, it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. And faith is not denying that the problems exist. I'm not going around, someone comes up for prayer, uh, I'm not going to tell them, say, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. No, 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 there's no power in that. It's, it's, well, I, I, there, there's, there's, I'm just going to act like it's not here. No, no, that, that, there's no power in that. It's, faith is not denying the problems exist, it's living on a source that's bigger than the problem. That's what faith is. Mark chapter 11 22 through 24, Mark records, John Mark records, Jesus says this. So Jesus' answer said to him, have faith in God. Okay, Bartimaeus had faith in Jesus. Jesus represents the Father in the earth. Everything you see him do is the Father doing. Everything you hear him saying is the Father speaking. Here's what Mark says, quoting Jesus, it's in red, have faith in God. Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, and this is what Chan was quoting, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done. So here's the first question. Do you actually believe what you say matters? Do you actually believe what's coming out of your mouth can change things? You got to ask yourself this but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have what he says. Whatever he says, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. This, this is a game changer. If we, could, if we could get this one or two or three verses right here, if we could understand this, everything about our spiritual journey can change. Because what did he say? He took that scripture. Okay, his, his intellect at a young age spiritually was, okay, that means I, I can, I'm going to move that water bottle. You know, like, like we're talking about a mountain. Mountain is a, a kingdom idea and principle. It's a type and shadow of moving kingdom stuff. And so you start looking at that, and, and granted, if someone was in a building project and there was no finances, and I've heard stories, churches, and we're praying and we're saying this mountain's got to move and all of a sudden uh, they, someone comes in and removes all the rock and they need it. I mean, I, stories like that are pretty cool and, 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 and prevalent. But here's the principle. Have faith, who? In God. In God. Don't, don't show up and have faith in Miss or me. Well, well my pastor said, <laughs> that doesn't fly very far. You know what I'm saying? Like, I get it. I appreciate that. But I want when you interact with anything that is from the, the opposing side, they know you. They know your authority that you're carrying into that situation. Have faith in God. Why? Just as Francis said, there's no one else. He's coming in the village when anxiety, when thoughts, when doubt. No, you're not going to get much done here. They're not. Wait a second. I'm Jesus walking into this situation. 
Different perspective. Have faith in God. Believe that those things that you say, what you're doing, again, why was Jesus 100% accurate? Well, he was the son of God. He was 100% accurate in his ministry because he only did what the Father does. He only said what the Father says. So no wonder he never missed it. You know what I'm saying? Like, he would nail it 100% of the time. So believe that you receive them. And I pray, do I believe God actually is answering what I am praying? That's a big question for us to ask. It changes our perspective. Now go back to the idea of healing. How many prayers have we or you've heard someone, God, if it be your will? That's why we dove into that quick. We got to know the will of God because now it's not a question mark. Now it's a, a confident statement and pray. And here's the thing. I heard a pastor years ago say, don't ever separate your praying from your saying. Because your words are the same. If you understand prayer, prayer is communication. It's talking. It's the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks. Some people, here's my prayer, and then over here, I'm going I'm to negate everything I just asked God over here because I don't believe anything I ask he's going to do. So don't separate your praying from your saying. What's coming out of your heart? Is it the sound of faith? Is it faith coming out? Believe that you receive them. Hmm. So think about that. Believe that you receive them comes first before having them. Do you believe? Do you believe that you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? That's, that's something Jesus said in the Gospels record. He told his followers, you will be able to do this. Believers. Believers shall... There's a, there's a reason that word is there. It doesn't say just people that call themselves Christians. Believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why? Because you got to believe first. So believe, you receive, and then you will have. Again, this isn't just someone else making up. When we say, well, John Mark wrote this, he's quoting Jesus. This is something Jesus is communicating to the crowd, to the people, to the disciples. And I want us to get it all starts with have faith in God. Don't have faith in the healing. Have faith in God. That's a byproduct of your faith in God. See, the, the, the principle here is I'm, I'm looking to God. The source of my faith is God, not the stuff, not the healing, not the manifestation, but God. God is the source. He is the who and the what. He is the foundation. His word is truth. That's the thing we're after. And Paul uh, said in Romans 3:27, he talks about how faith is actually a law. There's a law of works, a law of, 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 of like living by the Ten Commandments and earning your way of things, but then there's a law of faith. A law of faith, when he, when he calls it a law, that, that, it's not just like a, a bunch of people getting together and vote, let's make a law. No, it, it means like a principle, like gravity is a law. And you can only overcome gravity by thrust and lift. It's another law. There's laws that govern the natural realm. The same way, there's, there's laws that govern the spiritual realm. And for us to understand that, faith is a law. So when you have a law, it works for anyone, anywhere, anytime. And I want us to catch that because some people put someone else on a pedestal of faith. Well, they're a man of faith. I can't believe that happened to uh, Aunt so-and-so because she was a woman of faith. Again, God's given every man the measure of faith. You and I all have the ability to increase and grow in faith. And we can't go around measuring each other's faith because, again, like I said, if we were Jesus, we would be accurate in all those things. But it's dangerous when we try to get in and analyze, well, that didn't happen for you because your faith was at this level. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let God talk to her about her faith level and let her have that conversation and journey. I I'm responsible for my faith level. That's the thing I've got to concentrate and work on. But a law is solid. It's stable. It's not an emotion. It's not just simple optimism. Faith is substantive. I want us to catch that because Hebrews 11.1, 1, one of the primary verses that you hear, the, the whole chapter, man, if you just have time to read the chapter, read about all the faith. And, and I will encourage you because you get down later into it and it talks about, and, and I've, again, I've heard people uh, 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 kind of push away any idea of faith being important because it gets down said, and all these didn't see the promise, didn't see the manifestation. If you read the context, they're all ta it's, it's talking about they, they didn't see the full extent. Abram's promised generations that outnumber the stars. You're not going to live to see all that. 
it's a promise. He's hanging on to the, but he did see Isaac. That was the promised child, the lineage of which all would come. But majority of the, the passage of chapter 11, that verse is talking about they didn't see the eternal kingdom. That, that, that's, that's the promise we get to experience, it says. So again, we can take one verse and build a whole doctrine and it's out of context. So I want to encourage you, but, but it starts with saying faith is the substance. Now, faith in the present. Faith is, is always in the present tense. Faith, if it's, if it's for tomorrow, it's, it's, it's probably in a hope tense. Faith is substance. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the next time someone's like, well, it's, it's kind of hard to see faith or measure faith or I don't know how. It, literally, the definition of it is it's substance. It, it is confidence. It is evidence. It, like all these things are descriptive words of spiritual God kind of faith. I want to go a little further. So that was out of, I think, the NIV. uh, Here's Amplified. Amplified is another translation of the Bible that kind of takes King James and kind of amplifies it, makes it, expounds on it. So just just listen or, or, I don't know, it might be in your notes too. Now faith is the assurance, parentheses, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. Right here. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. See, we are in a a sense-ruled world. Most people have a problem with something they can't see, unless they're like, well, that's that's science. You know, like, well, you can't see radio waves. Well, that doesn't mean they don't exist. See, when you come to a lot of those things, everybody's like, well, of course I believe. But I don't believe you can't see this. But again, it's wrestling out like many things that people believe you, you can't see. It's the natural senses that so often get in the way of us understanding the spiritual identity of faith here is, is, is it's not just ethereal. It's not just this, you know, oh man, they just, they, they've been drinking the Kool-Aid again. They, they believe now. You know, like it is, it is as much, it would be like me trying to convince you of, of my car I own by the title deed. You don't have to see it. I don't, it doesn't have to be in the room. This says that car's mine that's out in the parking lot. A title deed. That it doesn't have to be present in, 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 in sense world world, but it still is something that you know is yours, okay? And I want you to kind of, confirmation, okay? You ever been to a hotel? Had a reservation? A confirmation number was given to you? What happens? You get up to that desk. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have a room for you. But wait a minute. I have a confirmation number. Here's the purchase. Here's the room size. You got to find me a room. Here's the room that's mine. That number, well, I'm sorry, man. I wasn't there present when you made the reservation. The confirmation number is securing your room availability. See, again, that's what he's trying to communicate as as the writer of of Hebrews is saying. These things are what confirm to confirming something. It means to give a new assurance of the validity of. Literally means by definition, remove doubt by authoritative act or indisputable, indisputable, disputable fact. The Living Bible says that this, what is faith? I mean, that's kind of what we're, we're answering here. It is the confident assurance that something we want is going, is going, is going to happen. Faith isn't maybe God will. I hope he does. Crossing my fingers. Hey, I've been to church this week. I actually tithe. I think he might show up and do something. No, no. Confident assurance that what you know he has promised is going to happen. Something he, we want is going to happen. It is a certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. So the law of faith states there is an assurance available to any person who believes what the promise of God says has been given even before the result is completely manifest. So, got a little sniffle. I'm walking around. Mike's like, man, hey, you look tired. You got like, you got a cold going on? Man, I've been wrestling. Like, honesty, man, I've been wrestling with some stuff in my body. But, man, Mike, you know what? I'm standing on the word of God. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Body has got to respond. You see what? 
We're, we're not denying something. We are taking something that is higher authoritative confirmation and we're bringing it in, this is mine. So am I asking, and here's the big thing, guys. Here's where we got to understand. Are we asking God to heal me? See, here's the catch. Here's where a lot of Christians, we start kind of, oh, well, maybe, maybe healing is right. And we're still asking God. So the question is, do I need to ask God to provide salvation again? Why not? I mean, I mean, how many Christians have you heard praying, God, God, just come down and help me in this situation? He already did. He came down and helped us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law and became a curse for us so that we could live in the abundance of the blessing, of life abundant. That's what he came to give. And, and to understand everything that needs to be done, he has done for us to live in freedom, for us to live in, in uh, uh, success, for us to, to, to carry authority in the Spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us his word. He's, he's surrounded us with body of believers. Like, are we asking God to do something he's already accomplished? See, that's where the challenge when, again, this is why we're calling this healing school, because we want to go further than kindergarten. We want to we dive into an understanding that is a higher principle. It's a more mature approach to what we understand with healing. Am I asking God to heal Ben this morning? No. I'm telling his body what to do with what God's provided. It's this earth and clay that we've got to have changed. So, again, is my confidence in... Here's where a lot of people are falling short when they're asking, is it God's will? If they don't know it's God's will, how do you speak to a body to change? Because we're still asking, maybe God will do something in this situation. No, no, no. And, and here's again, not our job to correct anybody else that is saying, well, I'm really, I'm really asking God to do this for this person, or I'm asking God to show up in this situation. I, we, can, we, can, we can wrestle out the nuances of that. The principle is we want that person healed. We want that person well. We want them successful. So, so I'm not going to ever get into an argument or wrestling out with someone and the little nuances of it. But for me, I'm going to understand when I pray, I'm coming from a different seat. I'm coming from a different perspective into this. I don't have to. You don't find Jesus. Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do? Just a sec. Let me go see if God wants me to. Your faith has made you well immediately. His eyes open. Jesus was acknowledging something that was present, and he called forth for that thing that was in Bartimaeus to come alive. Jesus hadn't even gone to the cross yet, and even says in Scripture that he healed on the promise of Isaiah that by his stripes they were healed. <laughs> it's pretty amazing how this stuff works. And so the understanding here, the Lord said in Jeremiah 1.12, you have seen correctly. I want us to catch this. This is what God's looking he, I am, God saying, I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. God wants his word to manifest more than we do. Every time, I can guarantee you. What happened in Mary? His word manifest. Be it unto me according to your word. What do you want me to do? Be it unto me according to to your word. God is watching his word. His word is already released. And that's the power of the last will and testament understanding. That's the power of getting scripture in us that we have something to stand on because the enemies will come in. He'll even try to tweak it a little. And, and Jesus responded with the understanding, confident understanding. Oh, you don't put the Lord by God to the test. I'm not going to do that. We've got to understand the word. And, and so I want, to, I want us to get this, and this is where we're going to dive in these last few minutes. So faith stands in confidence, not in the how, but the who. God is able and God will. God is able and God will. That's what he set the precedence in scripture. So now when Jesus shows up in heaven and it says he seats, he, he, he sits down at the right hand of God, you find one other example in Acts that he actually stands back up. That was when Stephen, the first martyr, was coming to heaven. 
I don't find anywhere else where it talks about him not being seated until he comes back. So for us, are we asking him to go to the cross again? No, he did it. He was the, the sacrifice once and for all. He doesn't have to do it again. We've just simply got to get in step in understanding what he has provided. Turn to Romans chapter 10 real quick with me. Romans 10, let's look at just a couple verses here. Paul's writing this again to Christians, so just, just hear this as him talking to us. And this is going to tie in to what Miss kind of shared this morning with, with the sound. So if you look here, and there's, there's a whole passage about salvation and all that, but let's just, just pick out 6, 7, and 8. It says, but the righteousness based on faith. Again, how do we get righteous? By faith. The righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will send into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? I want to stop here. What does that mean? In what, again, he is saying in, a, in a, a, a different context what I just said. Faith is not, righteousness is not saying, I got to go get God to do something again. Whether to come down from heaven or come up from the grave. Why? He's, he's not in the grave anymore and he's given us everything. Righteousness talks in a certain way. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So how does faith work? You believe in your heart. You say it with your mouth. Now, okay, I'm hearing this, but maybe I'm not yet confident in what I believe. Well, let's get it in your mouth first. Let's get the sound coming out, being a sound of faith. And here's the thing. You keep speaking God's word into you long enough. That list that I told you on Facebook that Missy gave this morning, you start hearing yourself, your, your, your spirit will grab a hold of that, and then it becomes that, that plowed up rows of dirt that the seed of God's word can plant in. And you get that thing planted, the promise Jesus said in the parable of the sower is it will produce a harvest, 60 or 30, 60, 100 fold. It's going to grow. So how does faith work? I get it in my heart, and I start saying it. And all of a sudden, things that are naturally controlled will have to shift because I'm connected to God. And Jesus is seated on the throne. He has provided what I need for the situation. Guys, faith has a sound. Your prayer will have a different sound. Not, not volume level. All of a sudden, they just got really loud. They had faith. No, 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 no. no. Confidence. It sounds different. It's, it, it sounds different. You get around someone who's full of faith, they're going to pray different. You're going to feel it. You step into a new level of faith, you're going to pray different. You're going to talk to God different. You're going to hear differently. You're going to attack Things that are going on in the natural differently than if we're in doubt. And we're just wondering, what does God want to do? It changes things. Hebrews says that faith is substance. It's the building faith, guys. Because faith is the building material for everything God has provided in the covenant. I mean, I'm trying to give you as many ways to see faith that it could apply to where the God... Here, here, here's, here's where I say... God never says no to the prayer of faith. Why? The God kind of faith can only come from him. I mean, you can't have the God kind of faith off of something that's not promised. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like there's certain things that, that well, I, I don't know. I can't find that promise. So for me to pray or talk to God about that, it's a different concept, again, than something that is very clear and very promise. His word is what produce, produces the faith inside. And I want us to catch that for us to understand that. You cannot have God focus faith past your knowledge of the word in regards to that specific matter. Now, I can have confidence 
in if and remember the question I think that was given uh, maybe a few weeks ago by uh, Tani uh, with with her son. It, I could I could have confidence in the fact that I can pray in the Spirit and and I will be 100 percent accurate and I don't even have to understand the situation. I, that's where my faith is. Not in their situation. I am confident that I am praying the will of God in this situation as I pray in the Spirit. See, again, you're, you're, uh, you, I might not understand fully what's going on in the natural, but the Spirit helps me when I don't know what to pray. That's what Romans is talking about. So because faith is revealed knowledge of our covenant, benefits combined with our will and our action then is in accordance with the knowledge that we have obtained. What did he say? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth in itself does not set anyone free. It's the truth that's revealed they understand. The knowledge side of that is what opens the door to freedom, to liberation. So when you see, here's, here's a, good, a, a good thing. You don't have to make this like a law or anything like that, but you can literally take anywhere you read the word faith and scripture and substitute the word of God, and it should not change the meaning of that scripture at all. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You might be repetitive in that scripture to say the word of God comes by hearing the word of God, you know what I'm saying? But but everywhere you get it because faith can only come from God's word. Turn to Matthew chapter 9 and let's at least get to the scripture we were talking about earlier, Missy mentioned, Matthew chapter 9. So that's kind of a fun, like, little side note when you see faith. In scripture, that's, that's where it can... It's the only place they can come from is the word of God. Matthew, Matthew 9, if I get to the right, yeah, verse 18. So 9, 18, this is the story Missy was, was alluding to this morning. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in, Jesus talking to him, ruler came in, knelt before him, saying, you see, this is the humble posture of this father. My daughter has just died, but come, lay your hand on him, on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose, followed him, with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, you get this? I mean, it's documented. She's speaking. She's releasing her sound. If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. That's going to be another thing I'm going to dive into at some point where scripture talks about the healing in his wings, scripture, Old Testament. That's talking about that. That's the manifestation of the wings were, were the, the edge, the tassels of the priest. It's really fascinating how God works all this. But she said this. So Jesus turned, seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. Again, such a beautiful story. Jesus didn't have to stop, go to prayer closet, didn't have to, well, God, do you... What do you want to do in this? No, literally, this is the most clear example that her decision, her faith caused action, and it pulled healing power from Jesus. You find nothing of him making any decision. I don't think it's rhetorical that he says, who touched me? It was... Well, he was Jesus. He knew who touched him before she touched him. I, can you read that? He turns around and he says, who touched me? I felt virtue, depending on the translation. I, I felt power leave me. And I guarantee you, it took him two seconds to know who it was. But here is the daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith, again, over and over and over, and instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making commotion, this is not a party. This is like mourning, paid mourners would come in in the situation. The crowd making commotion. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. Imagine that happening. Everybody's at the funeral home. Hey, yeah. Come on, get out of here. He's not dead. He's just sleeping. You're going to have a lot of mocking and ridicule. What did they do? They laughed at him. But when the crowd, but, but when the crowd had been put outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all 
the district. I love this, but twice, verse 22, verse 29, according to your faith, let it be to you. Oh, I didn't even get to 29. Let's, let's keep reading it. And as Jesus, I don't even know if you've got this scripture back there, babe, but I'm going to keep reading. As Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him crying aloud, have mercy on us. This is Bartimaeus. This is another story. Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. Their eyes are open, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. <laughs> but they went away and spread fame all through the district. I and mean, we keep going. We can keep going. The idea here over and over, faith is substantive. It is, it is, it is foundational to see something change in the Spirit. Faith is a big deal to Jesus, so it's got to be a big deal to us. It's not asking God to heal. God, heal me. God heals someone else. Faith is believing. He has provided it already. Well, God saves so-and-so. Well, again, I get what you're saying, but he doesn't have to do anything in this situation. He's provided it. He's told us, pray that there'll be more laborers and workers because the harvest is ready and the laborers few. We can bind spiritual uh, attacks against them, uh, deception. We can go and witness to them. I mean, even scripture says, how will they believe unless they hear? How will they hear unless someone tells them? How will someone tell them unless they go? I mean, like scripture is telling us God's done it already. We're not asking him to do anything else. He's done it. And here's the thing. I want, as I'm teaching this, guys, I want to become more confident than I've ever been in healing. So here's, here's my journey of faith. When it comes to leading someone and being filled with the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues, I mean, again, there's a lot of people, got a lot of initials behind their name that would tell you there is, it has passed away. The Holy Spirit does not do anything. Uh, cessationist theology, uh, there's no miracles, there's no manifestations. It was all in the early church just to get the church birth. That is very um, widespread teaching throughout the church, throughout the culture. That's just, that's, I, and I've heard to the extreme, all that speaking in tongues business, that's of the devil. That's the extremes I've heard. But I also know the Holy Spirit's been given to everyone, to the church to empower us. And where someone would tell you, well, not everybody prays in tongues. Not everybody speaks in tongues. Not everybody has the gift of tongues. I would tell you, not everybody's saved either, but they can be. Paul, in, in his own writing, Corinthians said, man, I, I, I wish all of you prayed in tongues. I, I pray in tongues more than all of you. But here, So here's where I approach anybody that ever wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. I, there's not a question mark of whether they can. I have a complete confidence. I can tell you, in two minutes, you're going to pray in tongues. I mean, like, it's just going to let me explain it. And then two minutes, yeah, I mean, it, it's not, we don't have to have the organ playing or work up emotion. Like, it, 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 is, it is just as natural as talking. I don't have that question mark, so it's very easy to be confident to lead somebody. I want to be as confident when it comes to healing with other people. That's where I'm working. Remember the first week we said, well, we want to get out of this. Man, I'm believing. I, I, I want to hold. I believe healing is for us. I want to go, I want, I want to go into a moment where I will never doubt it again. I'll never question, like, again, not that God doesn't want. Or, the question mark is, will that manifestation happen? That's where I'm at. How much fun, just this morning, to watch a couple times manifest right there. Couldn't do this, now I can. Oh, all right, so there's still pain here. All right, it's good. I mean, again, it's just simply he's provided. We've got to receive it. Faith is the key to receiving our healing. Yeah, just a couple more things. I want to share. So how do we get, grow in faith? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip something here, babe, real quick and come back to it. Romans 10, 17. So faith, Paul says this, so faith comes by hearing. The ability to hear comes by the word of God. The more you hear, the more you can hear. The more you hear, the more you can hear. The more you learn, the more you can learn. The more knowledge base you have, and especially applied knowledge, the more you can comprehend. It's just like learning. It's just like growing up, going through the school system. The more I comprehend, the more I understand, the more I can. Now, here's the starting point. 
The disciples understood faith's importance. What do they say? Help, help us grow in faith. Jesus, increase our faith. He starts talking to them about seeds. Yeah, you know, it's kind of strange, but he's all the time using things that were in their culture. And he, he just picks up a mustard seed and says, that's all you got to have. Mustard seed faith. Now, there is two passages that tie into Jesus talking about the mustard seed. One's talking about the size of the mustard seed and the kingdom. It's a comparison to the kingdom. Here is the smallest seed, but it grows into a big tree. Kingdom principle grows into... So, two different passages, but, but he says the mustard seed size faith. So you have to have just faith as a mustard seed, and you can goes into expounding. So here's here's one principle, and this is not in scripture. So just just take it, set it on the side. But the pastor we worked for for ten years in Arkansas, Pastor Tom, um, he said one time he was teaching, and out just out of his spirit, he said this. He's like, I don't know if that's true, but he said the mustard seed cannot hybrid. He's like, I don't know if I've ever heard that before. So he got a hold of people he knew in Jerusalem, University of Jerusalem, and, and so they did a study on it, and literally they proved that, that the mustard seed is one of the only seeds that cannot hybrid. You cannot, you cannot combine it with something else. It, it can only stay true to what it is. And so that created a whole new revelation and thought of, of having faith as a mustard seed, not just the size. I think that's good illustration. If I can just have a little... But I, again, quote, Jesus was looking for people with great faith. I really like that revelation. It's not a scripture, but he proved it out with science that this was accurate. Why does that matter? Because you look at James, he says, For let not the man who supposes that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is double-minded man and stable in all his ways. We have to learn to be single-minded on God's word. For James brother of Jesus, leader of the church, to say, if you're double-minded on this, don't think you're going to get anything in your prayer life. In, I'm out, up, down, what's he going to do? Not going to sure. James says we got to be single-minded. Double-minded means unstable. Hybrid means you're combined with some other. There's other scriptures in the Old Testament that says don't mix different types of woolen cloth and cotton cloth or what. I mean, it's like, it's really weird. You go in the law and there's these places God says don't hybrid stuff. So there's this principle, this idea of be single-minded on my word. I'm single-minded. God wants this person healed. God wants this person to go to heaven. His will is that none should perish. Yes, there's going to be some that perish. We need more laborers. We need more people confident in their belief system to go out and share the faith of Jesus with other people. So I want to keep growing. I want to be single-minded. I want to grow in faith. I want to get in his word. His word will cause me to grow in faith. Hearing comes by the word of God. Vine's Bible dictionary takes that word hearing. Here's the definition. The receiving of a message. I receive. Hearing the word of God doesn't just mean the Bible's talking to me. I'm hearing. I am receiving the message. Faith comes when I receive the message. And when faith comes, now I can receive my health. I can receive the promise. Last two nuggets we'll discuss for a few minutes here. Here's Jesus talking again. So if that's true, the word of God is powerful. It does all these things. It's alive. It's active. Here's recorded by Luke and then by Mark. Luke 8, 18. Jesus talking. Therefore, everything you're learning, therefore, take heed how you hear. I'm hearing. What does that mean? Take heed. Be cautious of how you receive the word of God. Have you ever like, yeah, and it happens. It's easy. We get caught up in, in the middle of a sermon and now we're thinking about like, oh, I've got to do this later. Oh, I forgot to take out the trash. Oh, did I turn the light off? Like, you know what I'm saying? Take heed when you get into God's word that you're receiving what he's trying to communicate to you. Take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him, more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away from. Use what you have, use or lose it. Like, take heed how you receive the word of God. Mark 4, 24 records, and this is after that passage we, we read earlier, and I think it's super important, Mark 4. Jesus said, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and you 
who hear more, and to you who hear, to you who receive the word, more will be given. So here's two places, two passages. Take heed how, take heed, take heed what. So here's the thought. Jesus is saying, watch how you hear it and what you hear. The sound, it's important. What we're allowing to come in to our spirit, to our heart, to our soul. What are we allowing in? Because here's, here's the thought, here's the thought. Just, just even taking the principle of the sound that's coming out of us. Are we critical and doubtful? Are we excited? We're, we're full of courage? Like, like what's coming out? Well, think about this. What am I hearing? What am I, the, the ear gate, the eye gate, what is going in is affecting my spirit. If spirit rides on sound, what's going in is affecting me. It's like, it's like someone coming in for counseling and uh, they're, they're you know, staying up all night crying and I just need someone. And, and you start picking apart, well, what, what, are you, what are you letting sink in? And everything they're listening to is the Lonely Hearts Club music and yeah, I mean, I got my tears, and like, I mean, like, you, I have nightmares all the time. What are you, what are you, what are you watching? What are you putting in? Well, I was just a few horror movies every week. Like, start there. That that just would be a, a common sense. Start there. If, if something, if you are feeling fear, stop the flow of fear coming in. That's just that's just a just a beginning point. That's it's not even like deep revelation. That's just. Start there. Start there. So for us, what's coming out? Is it a God can and he will? Is, is it a God has? Is, is it you never know what God's going to do? Again, where are you at? This is what we got to process. What am I hearing? Now, again, there are moments when you get in your journey that it's important what you hear. Quick example. Missy. When she went on that journey, researching and reading the Gospels and really diving into what she believed about healing was pre-cancer season. She had a foundation to stand on. We had the sound that came out of her was, I will live and not die. We stood on that. We worked through with the doctors. We did what we knew naturally. We did what we did spiritually, what God did in her body, all of that. But in that season, there were certain ministers she could not listen to. Because what would come out of them was, you never know what God's going to do. Tomorrow's not promised. You might not be here tomorrow. And again, you said, well, Steve, you just pulled a lid off of something else. I get it. I get it. What's the first command with the promise? Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. Just that one verse can cause you to think, I might can control how long I live or die on this earth. Well, it's just God's plan, and if this is what's going to take me out, so be it. All right, I'm ready. And I get the fact that Paul said, man, to be absent from the body is to be present of God, and there is nothing better to be in the presence of God, but, but are you done here? Is God done with you here? If not, don't give up. Fight. Get the thing that God provided you and I to have. So again, I know it's a whole can of worms of whether you can determine how long you live or not. I can tell you, walk out in the middle of the interstate, it, it'll be over quick. Or you get free from depression and you live 40 more years. I mean, like, again, that's the power of choice. Are we going to choose to grow in faith? Are we going to choose to receive the word or reject it? So again, you're not rejecting Steve. Well, I agree with what Steve said and I don't agree with Jeff. No, 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 that, that, I don't care about that. I don't want to be in the equation. I'm just saying we're open in Scripture. I want you to wrestle out with Scripture because God's the one. Jesus is the one saying, take heed to what you hear, how you hear. Are you receiving it? Are you I'm like, oh, I'm going to hold on to that? Because simply put, Jesus in the principle of the seed, the, the sower sowing the word, said that the, the Satan comes immediately to steal the word. The moment we hear truth, the enemy's not, oh, dang, I missed that one. God, I can't believe they heard. He's going to cause us, as soon as we hear truth, to get in there. No, nah, yeah, you misunderstood that. No, nah, you didn't really mean that. Now, that works for them, but not for you. See, that's what the enemy does. He comes in really quick to cause us. See, I want to I get the seed in. 
I want to get it planned in such a way that I do not doubt. Man, can you imagine confidence, the, 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 the joy that could come with that? God's got me. I'm confident. I am confident in the work of salvation and what Jesus provided. Does that make sense? This is what faith is. Faith is substance. It's, it's, it's a title deed. It's, it's, it's evidence that what God said is going to happen in this situation. And we will pray from a different posture when we believe. Receiving by faith. Faith is not just an idea. It's a lifestyle we live by. Cool? Cool. All right. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to having you back next time here at Highway Community Church Healing School. Have a good one.